Well, greetings, folks. Apostle Lewis here with you for another weekly Kingdom Outlook. So glad to be with you. And uh, I think I'm getting this one out a day late. Normally, I try to get these out on Wednesday. But uh, and normally Mondays, I do a lot of um, video, videoing, uh, video recording. I do about four videos a week. However, Monday was Labor Day, and I spent Labor Day with my wife, my daughter, and my granddaughter, who just turned 14 months old, and we took her to the Jacksonville Zoo and had the whole afternoon with her, and what a great time it was. And so I've been playing catch-up on videos all week, and hopefully we'll get them all accomplished, so I'm completed today. Um, so... Uh, do me a favor. I'm glad you're with me, but if you could, whether you're on Rumble, Facebook, or YouTube, would you subscribe? Uh, we would really love that. We're really trying to build the Gate YouTube channel and the Rumble channels. If you could really uh, go to YouTube, and there's a Louis D. Sienna, and there's a Gate, uh, if you'd go to either one of those and um, <clears throat> the Gate Church of Jacksonville one, and you'll subscribe that would be great we'd like to get that over a thousand subscribers if we can so you could really help us there um and then you know leave a comment hit like subscribe turn on notifications all those things but leave me a comment let me know uh if you have any questions anything any topics you'd like me to talk about because i really like to be uh i'm here to serve i'm here to do those things so so um what we're going to do is i just want to turn to i want to talk about humility today and now Humility is a is is a weapon against the enemy, and if not careful, it's a weapon the enemy will use against you. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about what humility really is, um, and how do we walk that out. It's easy to have doctrine. A lot of people have doctrine. They go, "Here's humility," and but what they don't know is how to walk it out. Um, because you know, for me. Um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. We were Catholic. My dad was having an affair. I tell this story all the time. Now, my dad came to Christ. We became like best friends. Um, he called me his pastor his last, um, about seven years of his life. I was his pastor and, and just humbled me that he called me that. Um, so I, I want you to know that um, I didn't see it uh, in my house. I didn't see humility. I didn't see godliness. I didn't see, we weren't, we weren't, we didn't read the Bible. I didn't grow up in that atmosphere. It wasn't until I was almost 25 years old that I gave my life to Jesus. And I've had to learn everything, um, you know, from that. I mean, I learned a lot. I've learned a lot, you know. Um, but that doesn't mean you know how to walk it out. So, you know, humble, some people think humble means, you, you know, it's like everybody else is greater than you. And that's not, that's both wrong, both ways, is that is we should never exalt ourselves over people, but we shouldn't be their doormat either. So humility has to be uh, a, a, a two-sided street in a way, in a good, healthy relationship. Otherwise, you have what Danny Silk calls yellow truck running over the red truck. And there's a dominant person, and they're always right. No matter what you say, you got to do it their way kind of thing. And so, but the, the easiest way that I tell people humility is, is simply this, believing God. When God says he resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, he's talking about in his relationship to human, to the human person. So when what does it look like to be humble to God? Well, you you don't tell God he's wrong. <laughs> you know, you read his word. Now, look at part of the secret of revelation is believing God's words true even when you don't understand it. In other words, I might not understand something in the scriptures, but that doesn't mean I go, well, because I don't be I don't I, I don't understand it, it can't be true. My my heart must be it's God's word. It's true. I just lack the understanding because God will give me part of the grace he will give me is revelation who will reveal things to me. But if I go, that's not true. I don't believe it unless you prove it to me. Well, then I'm in a place where why God's not obligated, by the way, to prove anything to me. 
He's not obligated to make me believe. That's, that's wrong. And so the first part of humility with God is believing what he has said to be true. Believing that God is true. God is good. Now, I think one of our dangers is we think that God doesn't get angry. That's wrong because Scripture certainly does. We have doctor, pet doctrines in the church that God doesn't judge today since the New Testament. But he's, let, let's have different levels of judgment. Let's, let's understand different things of judgment. Um, does God cast people into hell? Yes. Every person who dies today without Christ goes to hell. Okay? They, they, go, they go there. They go where all the lost are at. Everyone who dies in faith in Christ ends up in heaven with him, absent from the body to be present with the Lord. So in that matter, that's being judged automatically. You go, you can sit there and go, well, God's not doing it. That's just your choice. Stop with the semantics. Stop it with the semantics. Like this is the problem with the church. They, they don't realize that that person going to hell is a righteous judgment of God. It's consistent with who he is. And therefore, his judgments are being carried out accurately in that realm. And so I don't want to have a picture of God that's like God's going, oh, I can't believe they went to hell. Let's not, let's not have this picture, okay, that we try to create of God. Believe what God has said. Jesus says, fear him who can cast your... Uh, body and your soul in hell forever. Okay, that's a pretty, pretty significant, you know, scripture we should listen to. All right. And by the way, in the book of Revelation, it says that uh, all that will be thrown into the lake of fire. And that's and everyone who's not written in the Lamb's book of life. So I want you to understand, like, the humility is believing God even when it's tough, even when it's difficult, even when he rebukes me. OK, um, when his word, um, you know, stops my bad intentions or confronts my bad intentions, believing God is the, is the preeminent level is just the beginning level. of I, I believe you. I believe your wisdom. I believe your truth. And what happens to a lot of people and this happens a lot is they don't realize that when they resist God's word, they resist God. OK, so. Humility must begin with us believing his word and believing who God says, who God says he is. He is righteousness, truth, wisdom. He is a righteous judge. He is a, a, a God of mercy, but he's also a God who can get angry. He's not a God of wrath. God is not a God of wrath. It's not part of his nature. Anger is not his nature. He can get there. Anger is not a part of my nature, but I can get there. You know, I can get angry, but I, I don't have an angry nature. I'm not ticked off at everyone in my house every day. You know what I mean? I'm not mad at everybody, okay? And so, you know, you have to understand, by the way, you have to be able to get angry. Let me explain something to you. That it's not godly to say, to just let people, you know, walk over you. Let's, let's, let's say this. I have to have the ability in a moment. That if someone is threatening my family, that I will rise up as a father, a husband, as a senior pastor, whatever, to protect the sheep. I have to have that ability, like David, to protect the sheep. I have to be able to go out and fight the bear, the lion, and Goliath. I have to be able to do that. That, that takes a level of you know, fortitude and sometimes a level of anger. In other words, you're sitting there. You're at peace. Someone comes in to attack you. You have to be able to rise up in that moment. If you are like, no, that's ungodly, that's not, okay? <clears throat> uh, there are situations where I have to allow that. Let's put it this way. When I, was, when I was got shot in 2010, there was a level that rose up in me instantly to defend myself. When the guy stuck a gun in my face, something rose up in me to defend myself. I, by the way, I forgave the guy within 10 minutes, 15 minutes of that. I forgave him, and I told that story 100 times. But I, I'm not an angry person, but to save my life in that moment, I rose up. You have to have that ability. You go, well, Lou, shouldn't you die for Christ? Hey, I don't mind dying for Christ. I just ain't dying for a drug dealer, okay? You want to persecute me and put me to death because I preach Christ? Have at it. But I'm not dying because someone needs a fix, 
Okay, <laughs> you know, I got responsibilities, I got family, and it wasn't my time to go anyways. God can take my life with or without my permission. All right. So what happens a lot of times is is um, we have this misconception of humility. And humility, the reason why it can be used as a weapon, if anyone's always telling you you need to humble yourself when, they're, when you're in an argument with somebody or you're having a discussion and someone tells you to humble yourself, you have to evaluate that. They might be right. You might need to. But you might. they might be using that. It's the same way people use something. Well, you have to forgive me. Well, I do. I just don't have to trust you. You know, sometimes people use the word to manipulate. They, this happens to many Christians that uh, we think that what we're supposed to do is take a back seat to society. Not the case at all. OK, we're the salt. We need to be on the food. You know what I mean? We need to be in the community. We are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. And we are to be seen. We are to be heard. We are to be noticed, not by you know, selfish ambition, which we'll talk about. But, you know, sometimes I feel like Christians don't speak up. You know, now I do believe there's certain situations where you have to know how to speak up without sounding like a Christianese, you know, but that's learning, learning how to be able to formulate something. All right. So it says this in James 4, 6, and you know, the scripture, it says it in several places, but we'll just go with this one. Um <clears throat> I don't want to read all of it. Let's just start at verse 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. By the way, stop asking God to cleanse what you need to cleanse. Ooh, I don't want to get into this because it's going to get a whole new. I might do this in Walking in the Spirit, which comes out on Fridays. But we'll talk about that. Maybe I'll go right into the scripture in a different angle. All right. So let's turn to Philippians. Um, it's a, there's a great passage, a great, you know, passage of scripture in there. Philippians chapter 2, um, which I really love um, for this for this topic. I love it all. I really do love the Word of God. I'm, I'm unashamed about it. I love it. Um, let's read this passage that Paul writes. Uh, I do believe this is the last book that Paul might write. Um, I do think Paul writes this letter from prison, if I remember correctly. So let's read this. Therefore, if there are any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. You know, folks, you can have diversity of, of, of thought in your leadership. And by the way, that's a really good thing. But you can't have those people who are argumentative for argumentative sake. In other words, the disagreeable people. You cannot have disagreeable people. Here's what I try to tell my leaders. You're allowed to disagree, but you're not allowed to disconnect. You, I, I want differ, differing views, viewpoints of something. But what I expect out of my leadership is when we all meet, we have to make a decision that everyone gets behind the decision because you don't always win in the argument. You know, and if you only get behind your plans or what you believe uh, the right way is, then you're no use to the team. You're not a team anymore. Everyone knows that either this is what's going to happen. Either they all have to capitulate to you and you're not the leader. Or if it was me, I'd let you go out of the leadership. I, I would just let you go. I'd go, look, you're not working with the team. Um, you know, I have I've had. You know, many different leaders that have been around me. Some have been around me for 20 years. But I've had some that, as long as they got their way, they were good. As long as they were in agreement. But the moment you told them no, they've re viewed that as being dishonoring. It's not being dishonoring. It's just a no. It's not a no to you. It's just a no to that plan. Just a no. And 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 they would use that. By the way, they, we use this kind of thing. God told me. That's another manipulation of it. God told me. And then they'll tell you to pray. And then you pray and God says, I didn't tell him that. And you go back and say, well, God told me, no, don't do that. 
Well, that's not what he told me. Well, you know, that's why he has one leader. All right. I mean, I've had this where people, um, it's hard. It's hard to do this. You know, I think in the beginning of being a senior leader, I never wanted to believe that anyone could be, um, like any of my leaders would ever be uh, divisive, um, resentful. And I not that I was a perfect leader. Plus, believe me, there was times where I was too merciful. That sounds hard, right? In other words, where I should have been more definitive, I wasn't. And I was ex grossly too merciful in the situation. Where I should have maybe removed somebody because they were bad for the team a little earlier. You know, no one ever says this. Do you notice that when uh, no one ever goes, I fired them too early? It, the normal is we fired them too late. And the reason, now my wife once got fired too early. Um, but that's a different story. Um, but no one, more, more, more than often, we're, we're, uh, man, I waited too long to pull the trigger in that one because it just got worse. And um, and that that's a really bad situation. But you need, as leaders and as a church, you need to be on the same page. That doesn't mean... That doesn't mean you all have the same gifting. It doesn't mean you all have, everyone in the church has the same favorite scriptures. It doesn't mean that. It means we're here for a purpose. The gate church of Jacksonville is here to bring the kingdom of heaven. We are here to bring signs, wonders, and miracles into my city. Okay? We are not to be a feeding program right now. That's not our goal. Our goal is not to be a daycare. It's not our goal. Some churches, that might be their goal. Some churches are all about feeding the poor or some ministries, and that is fantastic. But it's not what God laid in my heart. And it, it, what he did not do is dislodge it from my heart and say, don't take care of the poor. It's just not the main thing I'm here to do, okay? And, you know, I get people come in, and, and uh, that's all they want. They just want to be a ministry to the poor, and I'm going, well, have a ministry to the poor. Well, I don't have the money. Well, we don't either. Like, we don't have an unlimited amount of resources of finances just to give away $10,000 a month for your ministry, you know. So it's it's it, those things are difficult to do. So you need to be, listen, you need to have the same love. And what, you know, have a love for the truth. Now, I think you need to have a love for the truth and a love for people. And if you have one or the other, you're in trouble. In other words, you can love truth and not love people. And by boy, there's a lot of churches like that where being being right is more important than loving people. Now, you have the opposite, which is demonic, which I think is really demonic, and that is to love people but not love the truth. So anything goes. Sexuality goes out the window. Gender goes out the window. Um, sexual morality goes out the window. Um, all that stuff goes out the window because we just want to, because Christ loves you. That's our message. Christ loves you, and he's not going to judge. By the way, Jesus is going to judge all of that. And as a leader, he's going to judge me by many things, and that frightens me, you know. I want to live my life wholly before God. I do. All right. <clears throat> you know, and so... You need to have that unity. So let's say you have a church that thinks that, well, you should never, we should never have to um, deal with, um, we should never, we shouldn't be the moral police. You have some churches are like, well, we shouldn't deal with immorality. Like if someone wants to, um, if we're not going to go around and ask people if they're a virgin, which I agree with. I'm not going to do that. But I don't mind telling people that that's the godly right. Okay, the godly God God's righteousness is that we live. You know, we're supposed to be virgins until we get married. I was not. I wasn't saved until after I got married. Um, and but I wish everybody would live that way. If I could tell you some of the things you will not have to get bound up in, if you stay free sexually until you get married. If I could tell you of the the demons you won't have to deal with if you do that, and how much better you will feel. In your life, if you stay holy and pure before God, how 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 little torment you will have compared to what I went through, you'd stay free. Okay, um, so I, I want you to know that. All right. So he goes on to say, 
He says this, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. You know, honoring people doesn't mean letting everyone walk all over you. It's not what Paul's saying here. And certainly Paul didn't do that. Paul didn't let everyone just have their way with Paul. Um, but but if we're going to have, a, if everyone is watching out, look at, if everyone is watching out for number one themselves, we're all going to step in number two. Okay. But if we're all watching out for the other person, if we're all esteeming each other. If we're all looking to make sure everyone else is guarded, we're going to be guarded as well. And if I, if I value everybody's voice, I cannot, I don't do things by committee. So that doesn't mean that what I want to do is I want to have a committee meeting on every decision. That's not what we're talking about. But what I will do is someone wants, has, says, hey, pastor, can I talk to you about this? I want to listen. I might not fully agree with what they say, but I'll probably learn something in it. Okay. Now, one of my requirements is, hey, you know, are you on board? I, I had one pastor who came to our church, and he was mad that we weren't teaching the rapture, end times, doom and gloom, the judgment, impending judgment of God, and that we were teaching the kingdom. We were, we were. By the way, we had signs, wonders, and miracles. He never had any of that, and he was so bitter. And I, and I, I sat him down, and I said, you know, you want to be a part. He wanted to preach at our church. He wanted. To, he was. He came for about like three, four months. He was like. Well, I'd like to preach on this stuff. And I said, well, preach on it. But we're just not preaching on it from the pulpit here. We don't do that. And you go, why? Because fear is not a great motivator. Love is. And we want to call people in the spirit of love and use fear as the abstract instead of making the fear the primary, like, you know, God's ready to kill you. Because uh, if, you, if, you, if you're in the fear if you're in fear, not the fear of the Lord, but fear of disaster, you're not gonna you're you're not gonna express God's love. So you'll start sitting and thinking, well, the reason they're sick is they did something wrong. It's what they had in the Jew in Judaism. They're sick because they did something wrong, and they look down at all those people as sinners because they had something wrong. All right, that's a long, a short, a short answer for a very long topic. Um. It says, let each of you look out not only for his interests. So it doesn't say don't look out for your own interests, but not only for those, but also for the interest of others. You know, one of the things I'm trying to do, I do in my leadership is trying to get them advance, advance, like how to grow their ministry, how to grow their influence and all that. Not just my own, but theirs as well. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being a form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. You know, a lot of people are trying to make their own reputation. I believe in having a good name. Um, I believe being a person of integrity. And then I found out when a former co-leader, you know, one of my leaders went out and bat lied, literally lied, said we didn't give him money. We actually gave him more money than we promised. And he just forgot to leave that out in his story that, he had actually spent his home payment and couldn't make his mortgage payment on his own failure uh, to do what was right. He just didn't. We gave him, man, I gave him six weeks off and gave him all the money without taking. I just gave it as a gift to him before he left. So he had six, his last six weeks of pay we had given to him. And then he wanted another month of pay, which was not nowhere as agreed upon. But we sent him money anyways. But my point being is that. He was lying about me, like literally lying about me around the people. And, and you know, I had, to, I had to hear it. Like every week somebody would tell me you know, the lie he told. And I would have to look at him like this and go, you know me. Yeah. Do you think I would do that? They go, no, that's why. I, do you think I actually did that? No, Pastor, I don't. Okay. Can you tell me what happened? I said, he put me in. I said, here's the position I'm in. Either I defend myself, but I, in defending myself, I'm going to have to tear him down. And I really don't want to do that. In defending myself, I'm going to prove that he's lying. I'm going to prove that he's falsifying stuff. I'm going to prove he took money. So I'd rather not. And I, so I was praying and I was 
like God, because I've always tried to, since I've been a Christian, especially, try to live as a person of integrity. In other words, I've looked at, I've, I've done offerings, I've collected money, I have, I have, uh, uh, I pay more taxes than I should. I have done all, excuse me, all these things. Because I always wanted a good name. Comes out of Proverbs: a good name is to be desired more than rubies and gold and all that. And that's been my life to always to always be a man of integrity. And then I was getting lied about in my own city, and I wanted you know it's not that I didn't want to defend myself. And the Lord said, the Lord had told me he you know that was going to be on the cross for a while. That this was going to be something. And I said, I said, Lord, He's killing my name. Like, this is really puzzling me, Lord. And the Lord gave me this scripture. I made myself of no reputation. And he said, no one can take your name away if you're a person of integrity. Because who you are to me is what really matters. And I realize that sometimes we want to have a great name amongst the people. And, and that temptation, not that that's wrong, by the way, Absolutely godly to have a good name. But in protecting that out of the mouths of others is where we get in trouble. In other words, I want to have a good name. If you want to badmouth me, go and badmouth me. You know, um, but you're lying. And that just tells me a lot about you, right? It tells me a lot about the person who's willing to lie about you. And that's what the Lord said. The Lord said, if you have to protect your, your reputation, um, you know, this is where, like, I, I do look at leaders who, you know, there was a season in 2019 where people were lying about me when I was dealing with the Todd issue. The only reason I, I defended that is because what they were trying to do was discredit me in front of everybody so that they could get away with their scheme. I'm going to do, do a video on why tribunals are from the pit of hell um demonic and wrong and um why we should never do them but also why we should have spiritual fathers uh in our place or, and you know people that can speak to us so people can tell us and this is where you have to be humble hey lou you're wrong now i don't take that as like i'm wrong i want to know why because i got to learn so you just tell me i'm wrong because you say so is not an answer but Hey, Lou, Scripture actually says this, and you should do it. This has been my life. This is how I learned quickly. And, and, and the reason I had the advantage was I knew I knew nothing in the church. Like, I knew I knew nothing. A lot of times, people, this is how it's used against you. By the way, you should never, as a leader, you should never say this. Just trust me. It's not, that's, not a, that's not a leadership. That's not a value. Uh, just trust me. Trust isn't blind. Trust is through experience. Trust is through relationship. Um, you should never do this. Well, just listen to me. I'm the leader, and, and, and that should just settle it. Okay. That, that might work in a pinch, but it's not going to work long term. Like, we need to have a relationship. I need to understand why you think this way. It's why... You know, it's it's enough to sit. There, it's not enough to sit there and say this is what we believe. We have to we have to explain how this benefits the kingdom. And there are certain circumstances where you have to. You know, everything's not like absolute. The truth is absolute, but the the situation you're in might deem for other things. Like people say, you shouldn't tell a lie. I'm just watching this on a video. You shouldn't tell a lie. It's true. But now the Nazis are knocking on your doors and you're hiding a Jew in your house and they ask you, do you have any Jewish people in the house? Are you telling the truth or not? Well, obviously, protecting an innocent life is more important than me telling the truth to that Nazi. Not to God, but to that Nazi soldier who's looking to kill someone who's innocent. And obviously, God, there's actually precedence for this in Scripture with the um, midwives of the, of the Hebrew children and the uh, Rahab. There's precedence where you don't tell the truth in this situation because you're protecting innocent life. This is important to understand. And this is something that I think a lot of people uh, don't understand, and they get really black and white sometimes, but they don't have situational awareness. We're not talking about situational ethics, but anytime you have two, two um, conflicting uh, truths, 
thou shalt not tell a lie. We should not lie. Okay, that's wrong. We should always be in truth. But at the same time, we were to protect innocent life. We're not supposed to just, you have to protect innocent life. And in that situation, um, God understands the dynamic you're in. You have to choose the two. And being honest, if you go, well, I was honest, and you watch them, the Jews get dragged from your house and slaughtered, how good do you feel? So um, you have to know the differences there. All right. Um, but when the Lord told me he wanted my reputation, I found that quite shocking. There are times where the Lord has had me protect the truth because it involved other people. So when they were lying about Todd and about this, the tribunal and all that, I had to stand up. Being silent in that moment, you know, was wrong. I wasn't trying to build my reputation at all. I could have stayed in the, I could have stayed hidden. Rick Joyner said, uh, I'm going to, is it okay, I release your name? And I said, Rick, if you feel you need to release my name, because I was the one he had investigating. Rick was just, I think, trying to get some of the heat off of him. I told him not to get involved because <laughs> they were going to just come after him. Um, but I was mentioned in Stephen Powell's letter. It said this pastor in, you know, North Florida. And, you know, Stephen Powell was just, by the way, I, I'm going to do a whole video on this. It's almost the five-year anniversary of this. I should do a, a what, what we learned from the tribunal, what we shouldn't do. All right, so humility is believing God. Humility is submitting ourselves to the truth. Humility is not always having to be the person in the room that everyone's looking at. You got to, in humility, you got to let other people rise up in the moment. You can't always have to have the microphone. You can't always have to be the one who everyone is looking to. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times I'm on the road with Todd. And he's like, hey, Lou, why don't you get up there and take up the office? Hey, prophesy. I said, Todd, I don't need you. Got, you got other people in your leadership, you know, in your team. Let them do it. No, no. You really. And I Todd, I don't need a place. I don't need a place to do that. I really don't. I'm just more than happy just to. Now, if you want to invite me to come and speak, I'll, I'm more happy to do that. I just I don't need. I, I, I do that in my own church. I don't need to do that. All right. So, um, you know, I do that in my own ministry. I get to do all that stuff. I, I don't need another opportunity just for the sake of my self-esteem. My self-esteem doesn't come from um, preaching. It comes from my relationship with God, who I am in him. That's where my identity, that's where my self-esteem, that's where my value comes from. All right. And so... A lot of people, like I, I look at, I've watched this. I watch people who are very gifted, but if they are not in charge, they cannot handle it. And um, they don't work good on a team unless they are the superior one. To the, here's how you know they are, because they're always around people who are inferior spiritually than them. So they're the leader. And when they're not the leader, listen, they don't last long. They need that attention. They need that the people around them. And they're always looking to where they have that opportunity to take over. And those people are not good on leadership. They're not good because they've never come to a place of just being able to be in the room. You know, I go places where I don't get to speak. You know, I, 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 get to, I do that a lot. And you have to be able to do that. You can't always want to be the one everyone looks at. True humility begins with believing God. And God says, esteem others greater than yourself. Believe that. It doesn't mean devaluing you. Here's what it means. It means valuing them. Our tendency, our human nature, is either to, number one, just crush ourselves, we're no good, or it's to be full of pride and say, I'm better than everybody. Now, you know, Donald Trump sometimes talks. Donald Trump believes he can do it. He believes he can be president. By the way, I, I, I see false humility is what you see out of politicians. Donald Trump wasn't that guy. That's what really shocked us about Donald Trump. Donald Trump voiced confidence. He had voiced he could do it. He had voiced so confidently that he could do things, which he did. The reason it shocked 
even the Christian world, they think humility is denying your own capabilities. That's not humility. That's lying. But if you if you ever hear Donald Trump, and I, I watch people say they've never met Donald Trump, and then they met him, or they had a completely working relationship, and they say, the guy's amazing. He literally listens to everything the person has to say. He goes, I, I want one attorney who defended him, I think it was during his first impeachment. He said, I was brought in just for this, this, you know, this impeachment. I was brought in just for this. Never met him before. He said, I can tell you that the public persona is not the same thing as you see him in an office and a private persona. When we were in meetings, he said, he listened to me explain everything. And he listened. He asked questions. He, he valued me. He, and see, see, what we do as politicians is, uh, politicians do is they give you a, a, an appearance of humility. But in reality, what politician do you know of that actually doesn't think he's better than you or she's better than you? Right? A lot of them do, right? They all think they are better at ruling your life than you are. It's one thing to be confident. And what you have to do, it's another thing thinking that you're better than everybody else. And that's what Paul's addressing here. Jesus was better than everybody else. That's what Paul's saying. Jesus was better than everybody in the planet. We know that because he was the son of man, son of God, sinless, perfect in all his ways, fully obedient even unto the cross. Okay? But he esteemed others. He valued those around him. That's what is probably the best way to look at esteeming others is have value for other people that you might not normally have um, because you think you're so good. And and by the way, that does go a long way in, uh, you know, I, I've, I've, again, I've had leaders that I've had to remove because they just didn't esteem the others. They, not that, I, by the way, they were, as far as the structure, was actually, um, um, you know, there was, I was a senior leader. Some of them were assistant leaders that I had, you know, other leaders and they struggled. They, they literally struggled with how do I, um, I, you're, you're not in my position. I'm not as good as you. You're not as good as me. And, not understanding they didn't get that because they earned it. They got that by the grace of God. I'm the senior leader at the Gate Church. Uh, yes, I've been faithful. Yes, I've been obedient. And yes, I've screwed up and I've gotten a lot of mercy. But I'm there because he called me. I'm there because of the grace of God, not because I am so wonderful. Now, there is a co-laboring with God and all that. But let's remember grace came before the co-laboring did. Let's remember that. Just like he chose me before I chose him. Let's remember what preceded me being obedient was the grace to be obedient. So it's always upon the grace. Therefore, don't commend yourselves. Paul talks about that in Corinthians. We don't commend ourselves. Don't do that. Lean on the grace. Love others. Esteem those in the room greater than you. It doesn't mean you. if, you, if honoring them devalues you, then you have a self-esteem problem. You have a, a, a wrong mindset of who you are in Christ, and it will corrupt you from here for forever. So let's not do that. I love you. God bless you. And I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.